All right. The Holy Spirit acts as my conscience or a guiding force, but is not a personal being. True. 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 Whoa, that sounds um, theological. Yeah, yeah. A personal yeah. being? Personal? He's a person. It's a person. He's a part of the three. I get down with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I suck it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that answer. I get down. It was false. I don't know. I like it. Yeah, I know, I know it's a guiding spirit, but I don't know if it's a being or not. I guess not, because wouldn't Jesus be the being? All right, I don't know. That's a, wow. I never thought about that. True. Definitely a guiding force in everything that I do daily. Prayers, everything. It's with me during troublesome times, and uh, I look for him to be there all the time. However you want to see it, the Holy Spirit guides me. All right. The Holy Spirit might tell me to do something that contradicts the Bible. False. False. True. True. No. False. False. No. No. False. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Hey, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out. Turn to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's where we're going to start. There's going to be several passages we look at this morning, but we're going to begin uh, in John chapter 16. We are continuing the series, True or False. Let me just say, if you're our guest this morning, we're glad that you are here worshiping with us. Uh, If you've been a guest for a few weeks, you may think, okay, I've been here three or four times. I've seen two or three different people preach on Sunday morning, like... What's the deal with that? We, we want you to understand that we're a church. We have multiple locations, one church, multiple locations. We also have multiple teachers. So we're all teaching the same content, the same message, uh, but you get different personalities. As a matter of fact, there was a, a lady this morning and she was like, hey, the guy last week, I really liked him. Is he back this week? I was like, no, it's, it's me. And she just kind of went, oh, okay. That's okay. It's all good. That, that's one of the great things. You get different personalities, different perspectives, uh, different life experiences, but the same content, same message. And uh, so we are glad that you are here and you get to have that as a part of our church. Uh, we started the series again, True or False, and I, I love this. It's based on a LifeWay research study that was done asking people who claim to be Christians different questions about doctrine and beliefs. And, and reading it, I was, I was blown away because, again, these are people who profess to be Christians, the answers uh, that we've gotten as, as we read this. And then also we did this kind of man on the street, and I appreciate all the people that participated in that, just hearing the different perspectives. So we started out in the series talking about the Bible. The Bible is the foundation for everything we know and believe. It is God speaking to us. It is truth without error. And then we talked about God the Father. And when you say God, that's who you think about most of the time. God the Father, God up in heaven. And then Jesus, God the Son. And even last week was interesting in our own little video that, that people were like, did Jesus raise from the dead? Absolutely Jesus rose from the dead. After three days, he rose from the dead. Was Jesus God? No, I don't think he was, right? And, and it's not that they were disbelieving. It was just maybe they've never been taught Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, and why that matters for us in salvation, and then this week, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit. Now, as soon as I say that, some of you, my charismatic friends are like, about time we talk about something good at this church, right? You're excited. Well, that's good. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit uh, this morning specifically, and and some of the questions that came up in that LifeWay research study that I just want to share with you just to give some perspective on what people think. Uh, First question, true or false, it was asked, the Holy Spirit is a force but not a personal being. So the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. Kind of like, you know, Star Wars, the force will be with you, the force will give you the strength and the power, blah, blah, blah. 19% of Christians strongly agreed with that statement. There was about another 20% that that didn't know. They agreed, but they didn't strongly agree. So we're talking about almost 40% of people who claim to be Christians saying that the Holy Spirit is just a force versus a personal being. Second question, the Holy Spirit can tell me to do something that contradicts the Bible. Now, that's interesting, right? The Holy Spirit God is telling you something that contradicts what God told you to do in the first place. 51% strongly disagree with that. You're like, good, 51%. Well, that's only a little over half. 
right? So, so just a misunderstanding uh, of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's job and what the Holy Spirit uh, does. So there's a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit and, and who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. So here's our true or false question today for us this morning. True or false? I fully understand the Holy Spirit, who He is, and His purposes for my life. So let me just tell you this. If you're raising your hand saying true, you probably need to come preach this sermon because I don't even understand all of it. But we're going to jump in together and, and talk about get a basic understanding. Again, in one Sunday morning, we're not going to hit everything on the Holy Spirit. We could do series. There's books on the Holy Spirit. Billy Graham wrote a, wrote a great book on the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about just a minute. Francis Chan wrote a great book on the Holy Spirit. There's plenty to talk about, but we're going to talk about kind of a basic understanding of our beliefs about the Holy Spirit. So again, when we talk about God, most of the time we think about God the Father. Maybe we think about God the Son. Very seldom do a lot of us ever think about God the Holy Spirit, or some people think about the Holy Spirit way too much and in weird ways, right? And, and so this morning we, we want to, to understand the Holy Spirit that most Christians don't understand the Holy Spirit, don't rely on the Holy Spirit for the Christian living, don't think about the Holy Spirit. Like when we think about the Trinity, we think about God and Jesus and then that other guy. Francis Chan, because of this, wrote a book called The Forgotten God, just focusing and talking about the Holy Spirit. When you think about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, some people have said the Holy Spirit is the shy one. That he, he is behind the scenes doing his work. He doesn't seek attention. He, he doesn't look for the limelight. He is the power for Christian living. Uh, I, one of the things that I always do when people like to really get into the Holy Spirit, and, and we're not talking about this this morning, but get into gifts and, and sign gifts and things like that. Here, here's one of the things you need to understand. The Holy Spirit's job is to point people to Jesus. And any sign gifts, anything miraculous that doesn't point people to Jesus is not of the Holy Spirit. It can even be miraculous. You can be like, I saw this miraculous thing happen. If the purpose was not to point people to Jesus, it is not the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. In John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus. This is so interesting, right? Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage. Now think about this. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Can, can you imagine the, whole, the, the, the disciples sitting around with Jesus and Jesus is like, hey, I'm going away. And they're like, what? He's like, no, it's good that I go away. Because I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, and, and, and it's going to be to your advantage. It's going to be a blessing to you. They didn't, they didn't get that. So let's just kind of jump in this morning. Let's talk about uh, the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you some doctrine, just so we have a basic understanding about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father, God the Son, and is of the same essence, yet He's also distinct from them. Okay, so there's not three gods up in heaven. There's not God the Father and Jesus God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, like three gods working together. There is one God, three distinct personalities, one essence. Now, how many think that's confusing? Okay, you see my hand is up as well, right? That is one of those things that, that theologians, people much smarter than I have spent their lives trying to understand. I've never heard a good illustration given that, that completely um, shows us the Holy Spirit. It's one of those things as Christians, it's in the Bible. We're going to believe it. We're going to trust it. We're going to try to understand it, but probably this side of heaven, we're not going to. But the Holy Spirit is God. But the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, is also personal. The Bible doesn't say it, it is going to do this, it does this. The, the Bible uses personal pronoun, he. The Holy Spirit is personal, he's not an impersonal force. It says that he teaches, that he guides, that he comforts, that he intercedes, that he possesses emotion, that he can be grieved, that he can be lied to, that he has intellect and he has will. All of these things are true. At the same time, the Holy Spirit is personal. Again, the Holy Spirit is God. 
The Holy Spirit is deity. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is spoken and identified with the title Jehovah. Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, indwelt by God. All the, the descriptives used of God in the Bible are also used of the Holy Spirit, that he, He's omniscient, that He knows everything, that He's omnipresent, uh, that He's omnipotent, His in, eternality, that He's always been. In the beginning, go to Genesis chapter 1, in creation, when time started, the Holy Spirit was there doing His thing. He's always been. He's equally associated with God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. If you have your notes, go ahead and take them out. You want to follow along with us with some fill in the blanks, or if you just take your own notes, that's great. That's great. Just walk along with us. But the first thing I want us to see this morning is the Holy Spirit teaches us who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit teaches us who Jesus really is. In John chapter 15 and verse 26, it says, When the Helper, Holy Spirit, comes, whom I will send, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. So think about this, Trinity at work again. God the Father sent the Son. God the Son says, it's good that I go away, that I send the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness about me. So the Holy Spirit came to show us, to bear witness, to point us to Jesus. Now, let me tell you how that works in our lives. Um, The Bible talks about that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and righteousness. Now, how does that work? Before you're a follower of Jesus Christ, before you're saved, before you're a Christian, if you're lost in the world today, you are not convicted of sin. You might have a conscience and maybe your mom told you growing up it was bad to do these things, but you're not convicted of sin. The Holy Spirit has to convict you of sin. So the first conviction that you're going to feel from the Holy Spirit is the conviction that things that you are doing are wrong. And up to that point, you may have not realized they were wrong. That's why I always say lost people act lost. They don't know. God hasn't hasn't begun to work in their hearts. The Holy Spirit hasn't convicted them of sin. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you came to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you were convicted of sin for the first time. You're like, the way I've been living my life is contrary to how God desires me to live. And you were convicted of sin. It says he also convicts us of righteousness. You didn't truly know good until the Holy Spirit began to work in your life. So the Holy Spirit convicts us, the the Holy Spirit shows us the truth of the gospel, opens our, our minds and hearts for the first time to the truth of what it means to be saved. Before the Holy Spirit begins to work in your life, you're not sitting around going, you know what, it's Tuesday, I think I'm gonna get saved today. The Holy Spirit begins to to work in your life and and begins to show you the truth of the gospel that you were a sinner, dead in your trespasses and sins, that that you couldn't save yourself, that you needed salvation and, and that salvation comes from Jesus. The Holy Spirit, again, pointing you to Jesus. And then the truth of the gospel, the gospel is bigger than just saving you. We live the gospel. So the Holy Spirit shows us the truth of the gospel. He places us in the body of Christ. The Bible says that we're baptized into the body of Christ. Now, that's not baptism like on Sunday mornings we baptize someone, they go underwater. That's a physical picture uh, of an inside transformation. Baptism just means to immerse. Uh, And so when it says that we're baptized into the body of Christ, we're immersed into the body of Christ. That doesn't happen on the stage when you're baptized. That happens at the moment of salvation. God's seal comes on us that we are His people, that we are His own. When, when we're saved, the Holy Spirit gives us a new nature. I right, think about that. When, when you think about your life before Christ and your life after Christ, hopefully you're like, there's a difference. I'm not who I was. Right? We're, we're a new creation. Now, here's what the world says. The world says you need to be the best version of yourself. You know, whatever you are, just be the best version of you. Look on the inside and become the best version of yourself. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you the best version of yourself. The Holy Spirit makes you a new creation. 
That's what happens when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. We become a new creation. We have a new nature. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. And the Holy Spirit gives us eternal life. When Jesus died on the cross and was buried in the grave, did he stay in the grave? That would, that's not a rhetorical question. That's like a yes or no. Did he stay in the, did he stay in the grave? No. Okay. On the third day, he rose from the dead by the power of who? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power that Jesus rose from the dead. And so what happens when we come to faith in Jesus Christ in the same way, this is awesome, in the same way that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, gave him life, conquering death, he's going to do the same thing in the life of believers. How awesome is that? So, so, so the Holy Spirit teaches us who Jesus really is. Second thing he does, he helps us understand and remember God's word. The churchy word for that is illumination, right? That we can read God's word and understand God's word and remember God's word. First Corinthians chapter two, if you want to flip over there, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He says this starting in verse 12. He says, now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. So underline that if, if you're here this morning, you have your Bible, your device, whatever. The Holy Spirit is teaching spiritual things to spiritual people, people who are, who are saved, who have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Verse 14, but the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He's not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. See what he's saying there? A, a lost person can, can, can hear a, a sermon, can, can read a Bible verse, and it means nothing. It's like, okay, just dead on a page. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because the Bible is the Word of God, makes the words come to life. We're able to understand them, able to discern them. They have a whole different meaning for us. I'll give you a great example of this. If you ever watch like the Discovery Channel or the History Channel, and it usually happens around Easter, they're going to have some documentary, you know, like the real Jesus right? And you're like, oh, that's cool. I'm a Christian. I want to read about, I want to hear about the real Jesus. And you watch it and like, it's just academic. There's, there's nothing supernatural. They're not talking about Jesus rising from the dead. They're talking about the historical Jesus and, you know, what we know from history and science and all of these things. And you listen to it, you're like, this is, this is so dull. This is so boring. This is so dead. Why? because they haven't been enlightened by the Holy Spirit to the truth of God's Word. The supernatural just goes over their head. They don't see Jesus as God. Jesus was a historical figure. He died on a Roman cross and he was buried. They'll even say, because we have historical accounts beyond the Bible, that supposedly Jesus came back to life and people saw him. But they miss the miraculous because the Holy Spirit hasn't illuminated to them the truth of God's Word. Again, uh, in John chapter 14, verse 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Now, it's interesting, excuse me, my father-in-law's in in town. We were talking about uh, chat GPT. Okay, first service, I said GTP, and my wife texted me. She listens to the first service and corrects all my mistakes for the second service. She's like, it's GPT. I don't know that much about it either, but I know it's pretty cool. Like, you just tell it stuff. And so, uh, my father-in-law never heard of it, and I was like, look. Like, so, I was like, okay, do this. Give me a paper on this. And then I was like, so tomorrow, I'm preaching on the Holy Spirit. Give me a three-point sermon on the Holy Spirit. Man, boom, three seconds later three-point sermon on the Holy Spirit, Bible verses and everything. And you read it, and it's all factually true, but it's all very academic. No Holy Spirit behind it, because it's a dumb computer, right? When we read God's Word and we've been saved and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit makes these words come to life. And they have a meaning for us 
that, that someone who's not in Christ may not fully comprehend and understand. And not only that, here's what's awesome. The Holy Spirit, when we read God's Word, when we bury His Word in our heart, brings to our minds and hearts remembrances at just the right time. Ever been in a situation where life's hard, life's difficult? Maybe you're going through a health situation, relationships, you're just kind of really down. It's like somewhere the Holy Spirit just gives you the words and the encouragement that you feel and the, the peace that you can feel and the comfort that you can feel that He just gives you that remembrance at just the right time. Or when you're tempted, have this temptation and this temptation is up and God just brings to your mind that verse that gives you the strength to overcome in that moment. Remember the disciples lived with Jesus for three years. Listen to Jesus talk and teach for three years. Now let me just put that in perspective. Guys, yesterday, if you're watching football, your wife said, honey, I need you too. Whatever it was, and you said, yes, dear. And you didn't remember what she just said. You probably got in trouble later. So imagine the disciples for three years are taking in all of this information. Jesus is teaching, he's doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, what did you, I can't even remember what he did there. I can't remember what he said. I can't remember what he taught. What, what happened after the resurrection when the Holy Spirit came? They remembered. They wrote it down. That's how we have the Gospels, right? This is what happened. This is my, my time with Jesus. So, so the helper helps us. He brings to remembrance, helps us to understand, illuminates God's Word, the right thing at the right time for strength and hope and encouragement and conviction. So the Holy Spirit shows us Jesus, teaches us about Jesus, makes His Word come alive, and then the Holy Spirit, this is what's cool, the Holy Spirit gives you the power for the impossible. The power for the impossible. Now, guys, I can only speak to guys, ladies, this may be true for you as well, but I'm not a lady, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stay in my lane here, okay? Guys, we love power, right? Give me a fast car. I have a friend, he's here today, I'm not gonna embarrass him, but he just got a fast car, he let me drive it the other day. 750 horsepower, stick shift. I mean, you talk about awesome. Like you can just spin your wheels in fourth gear. Trucks, we, want, we don't just want a truck, we want a big truck Lift it up with big tires and lots of torque and horsepower because we need that, right? No, we don't need it. We just want it. We just like power. Power tools. How many of you like tools, guys? You like tools? I love tools. You know what I do with my tools? Nothing, but I like to have them. <laughs> I just like them to be in my garage, so I'm like, I got tools, you know? You need to borrow some of my tools? I got some tools. So I have all these tools, power tools. I, th- I, I walk through Home Depot, I'm just like, I need that tool. I don't know what I'm gonna do with it, but I need that. One of the cool things, and this is cars and trucks too, different story, all the tools now are uh, battery operated. You know, you see, you plugged them in, they were electric, now they're battery operated. And so I, a couple years ago, Becky bought me, cause I need tools, I this bag full of tools. There's like nine different tools in it. And literally, I think I, I think I could build a house just with that one bag right there. And I have a couple of batteries. Well, the batteries are interchangeable. So I can take the battery and I can put it in this one thing, I don't know what it's called, and I can do what you do with it. Then I can take that battery and I can put it in this other thing over here. And like I said, I think I could build a house. Do some pretty extraordinary things. The only problem happens is if I forget to charge the battery. There's no power. My super cool bag full of tools is worthless, and it's weak, and it's anemic, it's lifeless. Now here's the deal. Most Christians live the Christian life that way. We have at our disposal God living inside of us, the Holy Spirit to accomplish the impossible, to live the Christian life that I can't live on my own. And we don't tap into the power. That's what the Holy Spirit does, gives you the power for the impossible. In Acts chapter one, in verse eight, you've probably heard that verse before. It says, uh, when you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know what that word power, you know the definition, the word that we get from that Greek word? 
dynamite. And dunamis, power, will come when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, let me tell you why that's significant. Give you a little context on that passage. Jesus lived. Jesus died on the cross. Uh, He was buried. So all the disciples are like, oh, he's gone. What's going to happen? Then he was resurrected. Now they're like, woohoo, yeah, let's go do this thing. And they're ready to go. And Jesus is like, whoa, don't do anything. I need you to go back to Jerusalem. And I need you to wait. And they're like, wait? You just rose from the dead. Like, we're good to go. But Jesus understood something they didn't understand. That if they tried to live the Christian life in their own power, they would fail. That they could never accomplish all the things that he had for them in their own strength. So he said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And I'm going to give you some power. We have that power today. When you come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God gives you the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what's important, okay? When you are saved, you are given all of the Holy Spirit. All the power is at your disposal. Now, whether we tap into that power or not, that's a different story. But it's not like I'm saved and I get some of the Holy Spirit and then later on, you know, like on your 10 year anniversary, you get like a little bit more or something like that. All of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is given to you. It's not a matter of needing more of the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of tapping into the Spirit that you already have. So so when it says, even in the Bible, it says, you know, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. That was just a supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in Peter's life. It wasn't extra spirit. It was just the spirit that was already there doing his thing. So, So let me just share with you some areas where the Holy Spirit gives us power and where we desperately need the Holy Spirit's power. One, in obedience. Right? If you think about all the things we read about in Scripture, the things that we're supposed to do, the things that we're not supposed to do, outside of the Holy Spirit, it's like the law. You can't accomplish any of those things. You fall short. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden I have the power to do and be all that God has commanded. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul's writing, says, I say then, walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. What's that saying? There's a battle that's taking place every day. It's it's the battle of Matt's will, the flesh, and the battle of the Spirit. And the Spirit is guiding and leading and directing in in the the things and ways that honor Him, honor God, and Matt's flesh is always fighting against it. There's a battle that's taking place. God's calling me to do and and be certain things. And and so what happens is, the the more I I, I surrender to the Spirit, the more the Spirit takes over in my life, and there's, there's less and less Matt. Give you an example. Over COVID, I started mountain biking. Enjoy mountain bike. I love mountain biking. I'm not crazy. I'm not like doing flips and jumps. I just do it for exercise, you know, three or four times a week. But like any exercise where it's running, where it's lifting weights, where it's riding a bike, whatever, when you start, you don't want to do it. Like you're sore. It takes time. I don't want to do this, but you're disciplined, right? So I'm going to get out there. I'm going to ride my bike. And then what happens over time? It becomes less and less about discipline and what I'm doing and more and more about this just, I feel empty when I don't do this. I feel like something's missing when I don't ride my bike. Like all of a sudden, it's not a burden, it's a joy. And the same thing's true that sometimes it's discipline to read my Bible. Sometimes it's discipline to pray. Sometimes it's discipline to serve. But what happens every time I'm disciplined, I'm surrendering Matt to the Holy Spirit who begins to work and transform my heart and it becomes less and less discipline and more and more, I just love this. I, I love what I get to do and, and, and how, how, how I, I feel free when I'm doing this. Like I, I love riding my bike. Same thing happens. We, we, we can have obedience when the Holy Spirit fills us and gives us the strength. So, so we have obedience and the more I grow, the less of a battle it is, less flesh, more spirit. He also gives us power for what I call overcoming strength, overcoming strength. Now, let me just give you this illustration. Maybe this will help. This popped in my mind this morning, but it was before coffee, so we'll see. Let's say I want to jump to the moon, okay? Now, you're looking at me and you're like, there's probably a couple of problems with that, Matt. Uh, Number one, you're getting kind of old. Not sure you quite have the hops you used to have when you were young. Don't think you can get there. Uh, And there's this little thing called gravity. 
that's going to keep you down on the ground. So it doesn't matter what I do. I can do plyometrics. I can do squats. I can do jumping drills. I can get really good at jumping. I could have a six-foot vertical, which would be world record. And I can't jump to the moon. Why? Because it's impossible. Because of gravity. So what does it take to go to the moon? It takes an overwhelming power to get you beyond the gravitational pull of the earth to get to the moon. The same thing's true of of, of so many, what I would call the sins that know our name, the strongholds in our life, alcoholism, addiction, pornography, lying, stealing, all of these sins that so easily entangle that what happens? As a Christian, we know we don't want to do those things, and so we try not to do those things, but we can't overcome it on our own. It's like jumping to the moon. There has to be an, an overwhelming power that comes alongside and works in me to get me there. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. When you think about those strongholds in your life, these things that you just can't beat, you looked at that thing on the internet and you're, you feel horrible that you did. And so you try harder to not do it again. And maybe you do good for a little while. You're three months down the road and you're feeling pretty good and boom, it happens again. Then you feel defeated and then you get frustrated. And then instead of trying, you just give up. The Holy Spirit is the power to be an overcomer. It's not just to try harder. Romans chapter 8 says the Spirit has set us free. You're no longer a slave to sin, to those strongholds. We're going to do a series starting in January. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a little plug here uh, on on strongholds and overcoming strongholds. But, But today, just to understand that the Holy Spirit gives us overcoming strength. The, The Holy Spirit also is in the fruit production business. How many of you like fruit? It's good for you, I hear right? Fruit production, Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those are evidences of the Holy Spirit living and working inside of you. Now, here's the deal. As a Christian, if you're just kind of evaluating your life, the question should be, am I producing more fruit today or less fruit? Hey, I've been a Christian for 30 years. I don't see much of this in my life. Well, maybe you haven't come to that place where you've said the Holy Spirit needs to take over. He produces these things in our life. It's part of that sanctification process. As as the Holy Spirit transformed my heart to be more like Jesus, all of a sudden, I love him a little more than I used to. I have a little more joy than I used to. Patience, that's the kicker, right? I'm actually patient sometimes. We're not perfect in these areas, but we're growing in these areas. So how do I know if the Spirit's growing and transforming? There's fruit evidence in our life. So he's in the fruit production. Then the last thing, the Holy Spirit enables you to accomplish, this is so cool, the ministry that he has for you. Now, don't miss this. Every single person who is a follower of Jesus Christ is in the ministry. Now, there might be a few people like me and some other people on staff, vocationally, that's what we do. And we have a certain role to play. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But every single person who's a follower of Jesus Christ is in the ministry. We've been given a a, a spiritual gift that God has given us to build up the church, to encourage the church. In Acts chapter one and verse eight, we read the first part earlier, you receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We use this verse all the time for missions and evangelism. Like being a witness is only about telling people about Jesus. The reality is when you are using and living in your gifts, that is a witness about Jesus Christ. You're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit, God is gonna, equip you to do what he's called you to do. So when you think about serving, you think about, you know, doing what God's called you to do and you're scared, he's going to equip you. He's the power and the strength. You know what I never thought I wanted to be when I grew up? A preacher. It didn't even cross my mind that that would be something in some way that, that God may could use me. Never saw teaching as, as a gift 
Some of you are like, you might need to reconsider that anyway, right? I understand. We're not perfect. But we have to make ourselves available, allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us to use the gift that He's given us. And this morning as I was just studying and thinking about this, one of the things that, that kind of popped in my mind is as a church, we're constantly asking for volunteers. We need help here. We need help in the preschool ministry. Can you help in the parking lot? Can you help serve this? Can you help do this mission project and all these things? We're always looking for volunteers. And, and, and it's like the Holy Spirit just kind of said to me this morning, quit asking for volunteers. Some of you are like, thank you. <laughs> but here, here's the reality. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're not volunteers. We're not doing the church or God a favor by showing up and doing something. We're called to fulfill the calling, the gift that God's given us for His glory, for building up His church. It's not volunteering, it's obedience. We shouldn't be asking, we should be saying, how, now here's our job, here's my job. Equip God's people for works of service, so help you find your giftedness so that you can operate in your giftedness and build up the church. That, that's what God calls us to. One of the things I've been sharing with our staff when we talk about our church and what does transformation look at like, one of the things that I've said is everybody with a job, everybody with a ministry. Now, there are some things we do just as volunteers because they need to be done. But there are other things that are callings, and God has given me this gift, and I need to use this gift for the building up of His church, the encouragement of His church. So we want to, as a church, help you to find your gift, because every Christ follower is a minister. He, he equips us, enables us to do the ministry that He's called us to. And one of the cool things, I'll close with this, just reading about the Holy Spirit, and again, you're not going to get it all in one sermon. You're not going to get it all in, in one life. One of the cool things, I think, this, this, is, this is Matt, okay? You know, when you think about when you go to heaven one day, and people are like, oh, we're just going to worship forever and ever and ever and ever. And some of you equate worship with coming to church, and you're like, that's a really long time, right? Forever and ever, we're just going to worship forever. An hour. He's already gone an hour. We need to hurry up. But here's what I think part of what happens in heaven God is so infinite and so big that I think for all of eternity, we're going to le learn new things about Him. I don't think we're just going to show up and it's like, here's everything. I think it's going to be like, whoa, and the next day we're going to be like, whoa, and the next day we're going to be like, whoa, and 10,000 years later we're going to be like, whoa, like that's God. So even on the earth, God shows us new things. That's why when you read your Bible, you're like, I've read that a hundred times and God just showed me something new. Here's, here's what, what I was reading, and this was so cool about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the proof that God is moving closer to us. And let me explain that. In the garden, before sin, perfect fellowship, intimacy with God. Sin entered the world separation. Holy, perfect God, sinful man. In the Old Testament, God would, would speak through the Holy Spirit and the prophets to, to talk to His people, and His presence was in the temple, but there was separation. Then in the New Testament, the Gospels, God took on flesh, became man, came to the earth to reveal Himself to us, but he was limited. He was just, you know, in Israel. If you've seen the pictures even on the news lately with everything happening in Israel, and definitely be praying for all of that. I mean, like, it's this little bitty country. And Jesus only actually did ministry in a little part of that little bitty country, like very limited. And Jesus said, I'm going to go away, and it's good for you to go away because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my spirit, and, and God's going to live inside of you. Not far away, inside of you. And then one day, when Jesus comes back and he reestablishes everything, we're going to have that perfect face-to-face -face intimacy with God again. So the Holy Spirit living inside of us is just him bringing us a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. When you come to faith and put your trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, God gives you his spirit to live inside of you, to do all of these things. The power for the Christian life 
is the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal, and this is sad, and I've been there. So many of us, we have Jesus, we're saved, we're going to go to heaven, we go to church, we're religious, we're moral, but we're dry because we don't live in the Spirit. We don't tap into the power of the Spirit to live this Christian life. We're not dependent on the Spirit. We don't allow the Spirit to to transform us. Part of when Jesus says, I I desire that you have life and have it abundantly, you know know how that abundance comes out is allowing the Holy Spirit to live in you and through you. It's a gift. Jesus said, I go away that the helper may come. It's better for you. Some of us this morning, we need to start living in the better. The Holy Spirit, allowing Him to work in us and through us. And if you've never come to that place in your life that that you've recognized your sinfulness and your need for a Savior, and that's Jesus, it starts there. In just a minute, at the end of our service, every week we have folks down front at the end of the service, they're just down there to be able to take God's Word and share with you how you can be saved, how you can know Jesus, how you can have this abundant life, how you can be forgiven. If there's never been that time in your life, if you're thinking you're a Christian, you're like, there is absolutely, that fruit you talked about, yeah, none of those things are evident in my life. Maybe you should think about, do you really know Jesus? Maybe today is the day. And for the rest of us here this morning, if you're like, I know that I'm saved, I know the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. For some of you, like, man, everything you said, I'm living that. Praise God, that's awesome. But if you're like, seasons in my life where you're like, you know, I'm not really tapped in the Holy Spirit. I'm not really convicted of sin. I'm not really living in righteousness. I'm not really growing. I'm not really becoming more like Jesus. And today would be the day to just say, you know what, God, surrender in me. Holy Spirit, you take control. You're in charge. God has something better. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word and the truth of your word. God, we thank you for the fact that you're alive, that you're living, that that you didn't just leave, but God, you gave us your spirit to live inside of us. God, to guide us, to direct us, to encourage us, to illuminate your word, to, to strengthen us, to give us power. God, to accomplish all the things that you want for us and, and the things you want to do through us. So God, we thank you for that today. We thank you for the spirit. God, I pray that Lord, day by day, we would surrender more and more of self and allow you to be king of our lives. God, for you to transform us, for you to make us like your son, Jesus. Father, this morning, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't have a relationship with you, that that doesn't doesn't understand that, that you're not an impersonal God, but you're a personal God, that you want to forgive us and you want to have a relationship, that, Father, today might be the day of salvation. That, Father, today... Someone may understand that there's a God who created them, who loves them, who wants to have a relationship with them and proved it by sending his son to this earth. Born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, 100% man, 100% God, to take on the sins of the world, my sins, but he was buried and rose again. And that through that, we can have forgiveness and we can have life. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the gospel. So Father, again, we praise you. We love you. We thank you for first loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our online worship service. God is doing so many things at Mission City Church that we would love for you to be a part of. Just go to missioncity.church to learn more. I also want to encourage you to worship today through giving. Click the Give button at the top of your screen and you can be a part of our mission in that way as we continue to see God transform lives here in San Antonio and online. We'll see you next week.